Good evening and welcome to All About Money. I'm your host, Drew Tegaker, and this week we're doing things a little different. As I'm sure you can see, we're not at our studio. We're, in fact, at the offices of the Hong Kong Monetary Authority, where I'll now be speaking with Eddie Yu, the chief executive of uh, the city's de facto central bank, about the HKMA's recent policy decisions and their plans to help build Hong Kong into a global fintech hub. Eddie Yu, thank you for being on the show. Thank you. Uh, obviously, one of the focal points of our discussion today will be uh, on FinTech 2025, the strategy that you just laid out. Uh, so given uh, that context, I wanted to start by focusing on uh, the HKMA's plans for CBDCs, or Central mm. Bank Digital Currencies. Um, you're currently in the midst of researching the e-Hong Kong dollar, mm. especially at a retail level. Mm. Uh, now, obviously, to use it, it's we can all assume that we would have to have some kind of digital wallet. Mm. Um, but when it comes to in-store purchases, especially involving digital payments, uh, the vast majority of payment methods and wallets are mostly Visa, MasterCard, uh, credit cards, Alipay. Um, you know, Octopus obviously is a big one. Um, so some might be looking at these e-Hong Kong dollar plans and the wallet and wondering what exactly will this be bringing that these already these existing systems don't already provide. Uh, your response to that? Well, I, I think you're exactly right, and that's actually one of the reasons why we are conducting this study. Um, the study that we have on retail e Hong Kong dollar actually comprises two parts. The first part is more on the technical level, on the system design, how the governance, uh, the uh, different technologies that can be applied, uh, is blockchain based basically. Uh, we have recently already issued a white paper detailing our thoughts about the technical aspects. But the second part and probably the more important part uh, is the policy and legal aspects, uh, which involve things like uh, data privacy versus traceability, the anti-money laundering concerns or how it can be arranged, um, cybersecurity, is it more secure than the traditional uh, cash or payment systems? Uh, and quite importantly, as you pointed out, uh, the user case. Uh, Hong Kong has already got a very diverse and efficient retail payment system, uh, whether it's um, credit card, uh, store value cards, uh, or octopus. Will there be a user case that having a uh, e-Hong Kong dollar will help the public to pay either more efficiently or less costly? So this is something that we are actually looking into. Uh, and for the user case, we're actually talking to the uh, service providers and the banks and see whether there are uh, applicable user case. Uh, we, will be, we are still conducting this study, and we will finish it uh, around the middle of this year, and we expect that there will be some initial thoughts that we can share with you and the, and, and the, and, and the members of the public. Uh, in the meantime, obviously, is there a risk that... Um, having this e Hong Kong dollar wallet, um, you know, obviously you touched on uh, credit cards being a possible avenue that you're looking at in terms of distributing uh, it. Uh, do you think it might end up uh, driving down support for these payment methods like Visa and MasterCard? Um, you know, because they essentially rely on transaction fees to be able to uh, survive, especially in an international financial hub like Hong Kong. So, um, is there a risk that you're undercutting? Uh, these financial payment methods? Well, I, I think there are uh, different uh, attractions of different payment methods. Uh, and it's a, a, a kind of like vast market. So it's really, it really depends on the preferences of the users. Uh, again, we are, we are not reaching a conclusion yet, but we are looking into the, uh, if we were to introduce uh, the e-Hong Kong dollar, what are the implications? Uh, and the policy implications can well uh, include things that you talk about, uh, not only privacy, security, et cetera, but also the impact on the current financial system, not just credit card or other payment system, but also uh, banks, for example. Uh, what has been discussed internationally is that if the um, CBDC, retail CBDC were introduced, is there a risk that there could be a migration of, the, of, uh, of deposits from banks into this e-wallet. Uh, this is something that we need to look into uh, and consider because there could be financial stability uh, implications. And if there are concerns, are uh, there ways to mitigate this? So uh, there, there's actually quite a wide range of issues that we are now looking at. In fact, the international community uh, is also looking at. Uh, I'm glad you actually brought up the issue of uh, the international community because 
In terms of uh, cross-border um, implementation of these CBDCs is concerned, uh, there seems to be little to no international consensus on how uh, a governance framework would, you know, apply to something like this. Uh, you know, obviously you're you're collaborating with a few other central banks under the uh, Enbridge or multi uh, uh, multi CBDC bridge uh, to sort of see if that's feasible. Uh, but in terms of developing something, uh, some kind of governing body in order to regulate uh, transactions involving CBDCs, uh, how are you looking to address that at least moving forward, at least under the Enbridge? Well, uh, the Enbridge is actually a very good pilot uh, that we are doing together with uh, three other central banks, uh, including the People's Bank of China, Bank of Thailand, and the Central Bank of UAE, uh, and together with the BIS Innovation Hub as the coordinating body. Uh, we've already done two pilots uh, on the feasibility and the proof of concept. We're now entering a uh, trial uh, pilot process uh, in which we actually put actual transactions of the participating banks and their clients into the system and see how it goes. Uh, as regards the uh, cross-border nature, uh, how it's done is actually very similar to uh, what is now being done for cross-border transactions. If you do a cross-border remittance, for example, um, the relationship between the Hong Kong bank and the Hong Kong customer will be one that will be regulated by the Hong Kong regulations. Whereas when the money gets through to, let's say, Thailand, then the, 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 the Thai bank uh, and how they interact with the Thai customer will be subject to the Thailand regulations. And there could be different regulations on the other side, for example, if there is capital control, then there's got, got to be some way that uh, there that, that could be a capital gate that can vet whether the transfer uh, is in, in compliance with capital control regulations. So um, it's, the governance will be actually done by the two participating uh, central banks or jurisdictions in the corridor. But I think you're right in that there are certain coordination issues in terms of how this governance arrangement can be made very smoothly. And this is something that we are discussing with the other central banks uh, in our trial scheme. This is one of the areas that we hope that uh, there could be some smooth arrangements that can be made to facilitate the cross-border nature of these transactions. Uh, you mentioned capital controls over there. That's obviously something that, that uh, Beijing is obviously monitoring very closely with the ECNY as well. Um, in terms of uh, the cross-border uh, uh, cross transactions that you talked about, um, you know, you, I understand you're in the midst of, of researching or testing the digital yuan, it's especially here in Hong Kong. And I think it's fair to assume that you're modeling a lot of that research, or at least the research of the e-Hong Kong dollar on these tests of the digital yuan. Uh, so when it comes to cross-border transactions, uh, what are some elements that you see benefiting the Hong Kong dollar, especially as far as these tests are concerned? And what are some challenges that you're running up against uh, with the cross-border tests? Well, well, let me first talk about um, the ECMY. Uh, we, are, we are, yes, we are piloting uh, the possible use of ECMY uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, it's actually more for the convenience of the commuters and tourists between the two places, especially Hong Kong and Greater Bay Area in future, because of the close uh, interactions that we have with each other. Uh, think about the commuters from the Great Bay Area coming into Hong Kong. If it, if it is possible to use their ECMY wallet in some of the merchants here, then it's a lot more convenient for them. It, it also benefits the uh, Hong Kong merchants in that they can uh, uh, get the, the business from the uh, tourists a lot easier. Same for Hong Kong people in Great Bay Area. Uh, many people, including myself, actually uh, reside in, uh, in the Great Bay Area on some of the weekends. Uh, and if we were to be able to get the uh, use of the ECMY wallet, it would be that much more convenient for me to get around you know, in restaurants, in uh, shopping malls, etc. And we're also looking into how we can use our faster payment system to top up the amount uh, that we might need in the ECMY wallet. So th this is actually more for uh, the convenience of the commuters and tourists between uh, Hong Kong and Great Bay Area. Whereas for the Enbridge project, uh, the main focus that we have, we talk about 15 different user cases. The main user case that we will first focus on is actually on trade. Uh, if you think about trade, there's a lot of trade-related settlement and payment. 
and, and if that can be done smoothly and, and uh, smoothly and also cheaply across border, that's the aim of the Enbridge project. Uh, and again, as, as I say, uh, the, the, the governance arrangement, the regulatory arrangement will be very similar uh, to what you see now in cross-border transactions. Uh, but the issue here or, or the challenge here is once we actually get into uh, the, uh, the pilot stage, apart from looking at the feasibility of the project, I think the next stage that we will ask ourselves uh, is how can we get the clients and the banks to use these channels because of inertia? The, the, the banks and the clients have been using their current system, although it's a, l a little less efficient, a little more, co less costly, more costly, but they've been using it for years. Will there be enough incentive in terms of the efficiency and the cost saving of this Enbridge project that will get the, the, the thousands of different trade companies to hop on this new channel and change their systems and start to use this new channel? How to get people to practically use it and make it useful is another challenge that we will need to uh, over, o uh, overcome. Is it too premature to ask uh, what, what, if you have any kind of rough plan to address that? Well, it, it's really about how you design your system. If it's efficient, fast, uh, cheap enough, uh, and if we can find a way to incentivize the banks to get their customers on board, uh, and banks are very keen to do that, especially if you combine that with another project that we're doing, which is what we call the E-Trade Connect, if you connect the trade finance systems on block, also on blockchain in different jurisdictions, combine that with the payment system uh, cross-border, that's also on blockchain. Uh, and if you put different smart contracts on it, that will be the kind of future model. And if banks and their customers can see into the future and start early, they will be attracted to it. Uh, Eddie, we do have to take a quick break, but stay tuned. We'll be right back.